Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here. And if you're wondering why the fuck I'm wet, um, he yeah. <laughs> why is my camera frozen? What the fuck? No, don't freeze on me. Okay, okay, my camera's fine. Okay, I don't I'm know. If... Done. Anyway, <laughs> guys, what happened was I um, I tried to start this video and I scratched my eye because it itched. And before the video, I was making some seasoning for my wife because she really loves spicy food. And you know, I, was, I was crushing up ghost peppers. And uh, I didn't wash my hands properly, which I thought I did. But what happened was, when it scratched my eye, it began to burn mid-recording. And I was like, guys, hold on, I have to fix this. And I paused the video, and I went out, tried to fix it with water... But it didn't do it. It just made it worse and worse. I ended up bur earning both my eyes <laughs> and partial of my lower lip. And I, I made it where I couldn't even see. I was so bl I was blind for a good while. My wife helped me get to the... You wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I went to the shower. My wife put me in the cold water and she made me a rag full of milk and all that stuff. And she helped me flush out my eyes and everything that's still burning right now. <laughs> like, partial of my face is on fire right now. Um, but, yeah. So, now you can see the problem. Uh, well, speaking of this, um, uh, speaking of this, if you guys check out my previous video, you can see my uh, chick, my ghost pepper chicken fire noodle challenge that my wife prepared me a special bowl of chicken fire soup Oop, for the video because I had punished myself because I failed the 50-50 challenge. Well, anyway, now that we're here in Fallout Equestria, uh, we're going to be in a very long chapter. We're going to be in the same chapter for a few videos. For this one is called Chapter 37.1, The Shadow of the Ministries, Applejack. The, this is the Applejack one. So I'm assuming, because apparently there's other names I've looked. Oh, well, anyway, I'm very curious to find out, is this just going to focus on each individual ministry mayor? Because I really want to know. Uh, anyway, I got some lemonade. <clears throat> oh, God, my eye is still burning. I told my wife I want to put ice cream in my eyes. <sighs> Ugh. Mm. I hate ghost peppers, officially. I officially hate just... I officially just hate ghost peppers in general. I want them to all be exterminated. Anyway, let's go on with the story, because I'm really curious to what's going to happen to Little Pip and her friends now. Now that Zenith is left behind with her daughter that she newly, ne now found, we're going to find out more. Finally. At long last, I have reached this point in the story. And at this point, I beg your permission to take a little liberty with the telling of it. It had been a long and winding road getting to Canterlot, and I still have to tell of the difficulties and discoveries that faced us there. The most vital of these discoveries were the six memory orbs, the final memory orbs, which I found there. In those memories, the veils began to part, showing me my true place in this world, my purpose in life, and just how everything was going to end. I finally got my first glimpse of my own destiny. That it took so long was probably exasperating, and you might wonder why I didn't just skip to this part sooner. In truth, I have skipped over a fair bit, trying to tell you only the parts of my adventures that were important or exciting enough to keep you reading. I've told you these things, I suppose, for the same reason that Princess Luna told wait, 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 already we're going into a topic here that is already making me ask questions. So... K-Cat wrote the story, yes, in Pip's point of view, but apparently this is also, quote-unquote, written by Pip. So, it, it would, uh, I guess that would, that's a good writing style, to write it as if Pip was writing it himself, and, uh, and actually aware of the fact that this is a story that has been written. That's pretty, that's pretty unique. Um, actually, it's not very unique, either, too, because I've seen books like that before, but still the same nonetheless. Context. Only with the proper context can you see just how meaningful those memories were, and how they set my hooves on the path that ended with me coming here and doing what I'm about to do. 
For all that, there was a long and brutal journey still ahead of me. I had only seen glimpses. I had not found my virtue. I did not understand my role in this world, and I was utterly unaware of the war about to descend on all of us. I didn't view them until our time in Canterlot was over, and I feel it would be too much to tell of them all at once. Too much for me, at least, to try to relive them all in order like that. So with your indulgence, I will diverge from proper chronology and try to scatter these memories throughout the much larger story of our experience in Canterlot. Thank you for bearing with me on this. That's awfully fast, Calamity commented, staring at the light pink mist that was already filling the streets of Canterlot as we looked down on it from high above. The steady rain had washed the pink cloud out of the air in days before, and yet the cloud was dense enough to tint the air merely half a day later. Most of the city was built from stone carved from the very mountain Canterlot embraced. Cobblestone streets had been lined with elegant structures formed from stone and mortar or magically molded rock. Most buildings of stone still stood, although cracked and crumbling from the weight of unnatural ages. As we flew by, a three-story tower, once an upscale inn, collapsed with a deep throaty rumble, sending up curling swirls of pink-tinted stone dust. Everything more susceptible to the entropy of the cloud had been reduced to rust and rubble, smears and stains that once signified objects, and decrepit structures stained pink and falling apart at the seams. Oddly, some of the most preserved things were those which had once been alive. The black and twisted forms of dead trees lined streets filled with dark, pink-rotted bones, many of which had partially sunk into the discolored cobblestones. The only other place that looked eerily preserved was the cluster of buildings that had once formed the heart of Equestria, from a scattering of white stone towers to the royal castle itself. And the colored mist had settled everywhere, faint in the air below us, thicker on the streets and between the still-standing structures. It will get much worse with each passing hour, Steelhoves warned us. By morning, the pink cloud will have returned in its full strength. I pressed my lips together in determination before saying, Won't be a problem. After Zebra Town, I'm not going to spend any longer here than absolutely necessary. One of the other things our experiences in Zebra Town had made very clear was that the threat posed by the pink cloud was directly proportional to its concentration. We had spent hours in the light haze of cloud that persisted in the Zebra Town police station with only minor health problems, nothing that couldn't be remedied by a health potion in some time in the fresh air. The places where the pink cloud pulled thickly, however, were lethal beyond even Steelhoof's description of it. We're going to land right in front of the Ministry of Image, dash in, and grab what we came for. I told my companions. Then, we gallop to the Ministry of Awesome, get what we need from it, and go. With any luck, we'll be in and out in under an hour. We'd spent the earlier parts of the day helping Glyphmark. Even now, for Sarah once, was little Pip is not taking her time. She could about zebra stealth techniques to the young adult zebras. At least, in such a short amount of time. Now, the sun was setting, dipping below the clouds to paint the world in hues of fiery orange and bloody red. We hoped to take some advantage of the impending darkness. Are you sure this place wasn't hit? Velvet Remedy asked, observing the level of damage that was evident throughout the city. Is this all from just age? The entropic effect of the pink cloud speeds decay, Steelhoof noted. If the city were not made largely of stone, it would have crumbled to dust long ago. Only the mystically protected places are significantly intact. Well, I reckon a fair bit of damage was done by the explosion when the shield came down, too, Calamity commented as he circled in a safe height, drawing us over the outlying city and towards the castle itself. I thought the missiles had stopped striking after the pink cloud went off. Yep, that's how I heard it, too. But that ain't the explosion I'm thinking of, Calamity explained. Remember, the mega spell pumped enough of that cloud into Candlelight to make the air look like solid pink, and it weren't like the shields weren't full of air to begin with. Of course. The air pressure in Canterlot would have been... Well, I'm not sure how high, but it would have been pretty high. No wonder the pink cloud seeped into every surface it touched to the extreme which, which it did. Well, I expect the moment the shield went down, there was one hell of a... Well, you saw it, Steelhoofs. Am I right? That makes sense. I didn't notice, Steelhoof said with a morose defiance. I was a little too focused on the falling wave of pink water. I reviewed what we had learned from our so-called dry run for Canterlot in Zebra Town, beyond the fact that Steelhoves and I disagreed on what dry means. The greatest danger we expected to face in Canterlot was the pink cloud itself. 
but the interior of the Zebra Town police station wasn't much different than Canterlot right now, and so I was highly confident that we would be fine so long as we minimized our exposure. Likewise, while we knew that the pink cloud had the potential to fuse objects to flesh, or each other, that only seemed to be a concern while within the highest concentrations, at which point such fusions were the very least of our health concerns. As such, I announced that I was going to continue wearing my armor and pickbuck. I'm going to put on my battle out of the moment we touch down, Clammy responded. That is a foolish choice, Steele has retorted, pointing out, If you insist on taking the risk of wearing armor, your enclave armor not only offers a much higher degree of protection, but its magical energy weapons are far more suitable for battling some of the dangers we are likely to face. Our Canterlot ghoul's words reminded me of one of the more painful lessons from Zebra Town. My combat skills were almost worthless here. The two enemies we were most likely to face were Canterlot zombies and alicorns. None of my weapons were worth a damn against the latter once they got their shields up, or against the former at all. In order to stop a Canterlot ghoul, I'd not only have to take them down, but then run up and hack off their heads somehow. Unfortunately, bullets don't tend to decapitate. Yeah, I know that. Clammy responded stubbornly. But while I know the chances are mighty slim, I still ain't taking the risk that I might fuse into the damn thing. He spat for emphasis. Our other environmental concern was the broadcasters. Steele has warned me that any broadcasting system, from pit buck broadcasters to sprite bots, are likely to have become twisted into lethal traps, even those inside. Fortunately, he also assured us that we should normally be able to hear the damn things before we got into their kill zones. Both of the broadcasters I had fallen victim to before had been underwater, preventing me from hearing them, and both times I had been traveling swiftly enough that I would have been thrust into their deadly area of effect before I could react. Hopefully, traveling cautiously would allow us to avoid such death traps while in Canterlot itself. Returning to his previous observation, Calamity mused. Still, that's a lot of pink cloud coming awful fast. You sure it's just seeping back up out of the streets and such? As opposed to what? Steelers queried. As opposed to, I don't know, being fed somehow? Calamity offered. Steelers flicked his metal shrouded tail. You think that the mega spell might still be going? I felt a chill at those words. I can't reckon how all the pink cloud ain't been washed away if it ain't. That was a deeply unpleasant thought. Velvet Remedy spoke up. But that would be insane. If the spell just kept going, it would eventually poison all of Equestria. The zebras couldn't have wanted that. No, not even they would have. I recalled the rumor Steelhoofs had mentioned. After the shield fell, the zebras launched mega spells to finally obliterate the city. But if that is true, then those missiles never reached their destination. It is possible, I offered that they might have designed it to function indefinitely, just to ensure it would last as long as they needed it to, and because they expected it to be destroyed along with Canterlot shortly after the shield fell. Only after it had done its job and murdered the princesses. Pyrelite let out a mournful note. We flew in silence for a few moments more. That is actually a good no, thought. I said telekinetically snatching the Fluttershy orb away from Velvet Remedy, she brought it out of one of her medical boxes. She gasped as the orb floated away from her. Little Pip, give that back, she demanded, her voice lowering. I frowned but shook my head. You've been losing yourself in this too much, Velvet. It's really beginning to worry me. I'd been letting this go for weeks. After all, her reliance on the Fluttershy orb had seemed to wane after Pilot had joined us. But ever since the Balefire Phoenix had been injured, and Velvet Remedy had neglected a dying pony to save her, my unicorn friend had been turning to the orb with even greater frequency than before. Excuse me? Velvet huffed, telekinetically snatching it back. I'm pretty sure I've spent nowhere near the amount of time lost in memory orbs that you have, she pointed out. And I've been a lot smarter about when and where to do so. Ouch. Okay, all true. But at least I'm not viewing the same one over and over and over, I said, trying to sound perfectly reasonable. That can't be healthy for you. Velvet frowned. It's because I like this one. 
No matter how bad it is out here, I can always find some solace in Fluttershy. I cringed inside. And yes, it is escapism. So is reading a book, she challenged. Would you be so concerned if I read the same book over and over and over? We all have our own little things that help us get through the day. And at least mine isn't self-destructive. I could feel her on the verge of bringing up party time mint owls, but Velvet Remy reined herself in, not wishing to cut that deep. Instead, she sighed. This world is horrible, and I don't seem to be doing a whole lot to make it all better. All of my friends insist on risking death and dismemberment on a daily basis. I don't, Steele has interjected. Yes, well, you're being an entirely different problem, aren't you? Velvet snapped. My old home was assaulted, those I knew slaughtered, and now we're about to dive into poison at the behest of a psychotic despot who would see the extinction of pony kind. So maybe a little escapism is in order just to keep my sanity. Seelhoves turned towards me but said nothing. I knew my own reasons for wanting to curb her Fluttershy worship, but this clearly wasn't the way. What is that? Velvet Remedy asked, changing the subject with the point of a hoof. I watched her tuck the orb away before turning to see what had caught her eye. The setting sun was passing behind a tall, slender white spire that rose up from the city, taller than the highest tower of the castle, and flanked by a pair of marble wings easily three stories tall. The light of the sun seemed to ignite a nimbus around the spire as its shadow slashed across the city below. The Celestian Monument, Steele has informed us. Princess Luna had it constructed after Princess Celestia stepped down to honor her and her thousand years of peaceful rule. Of course. That would be why it's taller than the castle. Velvet Remedy nodded. Luna was making it clear to every pony that she didn't see herself as a replacement for Celestia. Beyond the Celestian Monument stretched a lifeless field <clears throat> lined with ugly dead trees that seemed to reach out of the dirt like grasping skeletal claws. Okay, back... The field was... Okay, okay, I'm going to recall back to what I said in a previous video, in one of the previous follow-up question videos, is I asked a question about what happened to Luna and Celestia. Oscar, you said that, that it would be made, made clear soon and I would find out, and I'm very curious to find out the truth. Like, I don't care if it's bad, I don't care if it's good, but I just want to know how they went. Or if they're still alive, or whatever. I want to know what happened to them. That's all. Bordered by broken cobblestone walkways, in the center sank a huge rectangular pool of pink-saturated water. Rising opposite the monument was the royal castle itself, a glorious mass of crumbling spires and cracked white stone. The field was flanked by the silent sentinels of six preserved buildings standing across from each other like pieces on a chessboard. The ministries each now a shadow of their regal, impressive former selves. This was Ministry Walk. That there's a whole lot of alicorns, Calamity whistled, staring down at the dark forms which swarmed around the far end of Ministry Walk. We had been warned of alicorns in the Canterlot ruins, but I assumed they would be scattered about the city. Instead, they amassed in Ministry Walk. It was almost as if something about the castle drew the alicorns close, like bugs around a lantern. So much for setting down a ministry walk. They would be all over us before the Sky Bandit touched ground, and Alicorns were yet another enemy that my skill with firearms was pretty much useless against. At least as soon as they got their damn shields up. Alicorns were some of the most powerful and dangerous opponents in the equestrian wasteland, but at least they had been predictable. The encounter in Zebratown had changed all of that. In the pink, the Alicorns lost their telepathy and their connection with the goddess. Here, they were individuals, and their tactics and demeanor radically changed. Logically, I didn't have enough experience to be sure, but my instincts were telling me to expect these alicorns to be more clever than the ones I'd fought in Appaloosa and Manhattan. Their individuality would allow for more creative tactical thinking. At the same time, they should be less coordinated. And if my suspicions bore out, less magically threatening. With the exception of what I had come to think of as their breed powers, all alicorns seemed to possess the same spells. But the only spell the alicorns had used in Zebra Town, aside from their shields, was a lightning bolt spell, and only one of them had used that. 
If all of them had possessed the full range of spells normal for alicorns, we would have been slaughtered. Instead, I had come to suspect that the alicorns were all tapping into a common pool of spell knowledge, one granted by the goddess, and when they lost their connection to her, they lost most of their spells as well. Too bad the damn shield spell seemed inherent. Okay, new plan, I announced. We land in that cluster of buildings on the opposite side of the Celestian Monument, and we sneak our way in, moving quickly from building to building until we reach our targets. Steelers, which one of those buildings is the Ministry of Awesome? The Ministry of Awesome is the smaller building made of glassy black stone. Farthest up, right next to the castle and across from the Ministry of Morale, Steelers answered, adding for clarification, the Ministry of Morale is the one with the mooring tower for Pinkie Pie balloons. Right next to the castle. Of course it was. I brought up my eyes for its sparkle as Calamity winged us back around the monument and started to look for a good place to land. Directly behind the monument stretched an assemblage of moderately preserved structures adorned with golden rooftops. The buildings were littered over a generous expanse of space that I imagined must have been a park. A small river snaked through it, the water tainted by ribbons of pink, terminating an inner-city lake. Here we go, everypony, Calamity called as he picked a spot and began to shed altitude. I was thankful for Calamity's warning, even though there wasn't really anything to do but brace ourselves. Velvet Remedy took a deep breath, apparently intending to hold it while we dropped down through the pink cloud. We <clears> dropped <throat> into the pink. The tint of the sky transformed the sunset into something utterly alien the red and orange hues shifting into sickly malignant colors. Yay! Well, even with the change of plans, we should be in and out within a few hours. My eyes forward sparkle flashed a location name sent from my Pitbuck's auto-mapping spell. Princess Celestia's School for Gifted Unicorns. A cluster of lights flared up on my EFS compass, none of them immediately hostile. I turned my attention in their direction as Calamity flew us down between the rooftops of the tallest buildings. The lights came from within one of them. I urged Calamity to fly a little lower, just for safety. Ivory Tower, my EFS proclaimed as we neared the elegant structure with the golden onion. Graduate studies. One of the uppermost floors of the Ivory Tower had boasted a beautiful multi-story window. During the Mega Spell attack, Mounting air pressure had caused the window to implode, and the whole tower had filled with pink cloud. As we passed, I could see into what had once been a library. The books all long rotted away. The ivory tower had become a pooling place. I could see thick wisps of nearly solid pink floating up the stairs from the chamber below. Several darkened reptilian forms slouched about the library, occasionally flexing leathery wings. One of the creatures was curled up in a shattered bowl of what had once been a giant hourglass, snoozing soundly. Dragons. Canterlot ghoulized adolescent dragons. About Spike's age, I thought as I remembered being trapped in Spike's body, oh. recalling the feeling of his wings. Oh! They could be his siblings, I realized, trapped forever and under... I forget that Spike's bir circumstances of birth was inside the ma school magic school where Twilight hatched him herself. And so does that process go along with all unicorns who enter? They always have a dragon companion? Or is that just Twilight's case? And she got to keep Spike. That would make a lot of sense. So that means these are a bunch of baby ghoul dragons and they're all stuck in stuck in time inside that building. Damn. Developed bodies that could not grow and would not die. The sight struck a melancholy chord in my heart. A sad note that continued to play, even as three of their corresponding lights shifted to red. Three of the Canterlot ghouls rounded, watching as we passed then spread out their wings and launched themselves after us. Steelhills reacted immediately, dashing towards the back window of the Sky Bandit. Steelhills, wait! I called out, unsure if my actions were wise, but unwilling to make the mistake of shooting first yet again. Velvet, you're up! Letting out a breath she had been holding, Velvet Remedy jumped to her hooves, flashing me an odd expression as she passed. 
It was either her way of silently saying, about time, or she was still upset with me over trying to take the Fluttershy orb away. Velvetorn glowed softly as Steelhoof stepped aside, making way for her. Dragons of Canterlot! Her voice boomed, magnified majestically. We are but little pony travelers, humbled to be in your magnificent presence. We beseech you to allow us passage throughout your territory. We promise our visit will be brief, and we will be of no bother at all. Really? Steele's voice rumbled, his tone making it very clear Velvet Remedy's diplomacy couldn't possibly work. No, she whispered back. Not really. She turned back to me. Sorry about this, little Pip. Food! One of the dragons bellowed. Oh, God! Great. They ate ponies. Of course they ate ponies. Mr. Topaz had been planning a feast, after all. Why, yes, of course, Velvet Remedy replied. I wouldn't think of passing through your home without bringing something to pay the toll. With that, she floated out one of the dresses she had bought for me at Ten Pony Tower. The only one I noted, which had several pretty sapphires woven into the hems. I'm afraid I only have one gift, so I do hope you don't mind sharing. She tossed the garment out of... Oh yeah, because the gem... She's using the dress because the because they eat gems. And I just realized, this is the dress of Sapphire Shores! Why didn't I put the two and two together? The sky bent its back window, and the three dragons immediately scrambled after the gemstone-studded dress. Turning back around, Velvet Remedy smiled and suggested, Let's go inside before they finish fighting each other. I leapt from the sky bin at the moment it touched the ground, levitating our supplies with us. We had left everything but the essentials back with Xanath and Glyphmark. Calamity released himself from the harness immediately. Hey look, Calamity said, pointing between the nearby buildings at the rubble of Clip Clop's clipboards a few blocks away. Maybe we should stop by there on our way back, he suggested as we all began to gallop towards the closest building. Perfect time to get a blade of armor for the Sky Bandit. No getting sidetracked. Wait. What? I blinked at Calamity in confusion. Yep. Ain't you notice all the clipboards laying about everywhere? Calamity asked, flying alongside us. Darn things are nigh indestructible. I honestly hadn't noticed. But then, I didn't scavenge as relentlessly as Calamity did. Still, clipboards as armor? He had to be joking. That'd be hilarious. Made out of pure, compressed, obstinate tanium, they is. Calamity continued. Bet you not even little Mac could punch a hole in one. Obstinate tanium? There was no such thing as... Oh, I get it now. Well, sure, the new ones were... But only after they stopped making them out of laid stubbinite. Careful there, Steelhoves grunted. The Apple family had a monopoly on stubbornite mines. Velvet Remedy chased behind us, a confused face on her face. I thought they were apple farmers, she whispered to Pyrolite, who was flying alongside her. Well, shucks, Calamity said. If some ponies hadn't been hogging all the stubbornite for themselves, maybe they wouldn't have had to run out like they did. I'll have you know that Applejack never once hogged Stubbornite, Steelhose countered. She used every bit she had. I blinked, mouth hanging open. Did Steelhose just make a joke about Applejack? Wait! Wow, that was new. Wait, what? A wave of pain blasted through my- <laughs> They're making joke about out of pending doom here. Oh my god. Oh my god. They're they're about, they are sitting in the pink cloud, with risk of death, and they're making jokes about clipboards. What the fuck? <laughs> My giggly bitch. My head as I reached the steps of the building door, my EFS flashing the name of the building amidst medical warnings. I felt like there was a vice tightening around my horn. My vision blurred and my ears began to ring. I stumbled back and the pain immediately faded. Whoa, I called out, 
holding out a foreleg to stop the others behind me. I wasn't quite fast enough. Calamity didn't stop, flying right over me and slamming through the door. As soon as the door was open, I could hear the static. Calamity was halfway into the lobby beyond when he landed, staggering and spun about. I could see blood beginning to seep out of his ears and the corners of his eyes as he turned to look towards us, his face grimacing in pain. Then he looked up above and bit at the air. I could see his bloodied eyes widen as he realized he wasn't wearing his battle saddle. Wobbling, he shouted out, pointing above the door, Little Pip, right there. Then he toppled to his knees. I dashed inside, drawing Little Macintosh from its holder, ignoring the explosions of pain in my head and the sudden tint of red in my eyes. I spun around, instantly spotting the school's public address speaker built into the wall just above the bust of the goddess Celestia that looked down at us from above the door. God. Blam. My first shot missed. I like it when he says blam. Near the speaker. My vision was getting rapidly worse, and I couldn't use my targeting sp I don't know if I've said this in my videos, but I like the way Crazed Rambling says blam. The way how deep he makes it. I love Crazed Rambling's deep voices. They're fucking awesome. Bell. It didn't recognize the speaker as a target. There's nothing for it to lock onto. Blam, blam. My second shot shattered Celestia's face. The third hit the speaker, which finally exploded in a shower of sparks. The sound of static softened, but still remained. The pain didn't go away. There was at least one more speaker in here. I looked around, but my vision was swimming in red. I couldn't see anything. The ringing in my ears drowned out nearly everything else. I could barely hear the explosions all around me as I lost my equilibrium and fell onto my side, my vision fading to black. My vision cleared again, almost instantly, leaving my ears softly ringing and a comparatively minor headache beating my brain. The others had charged in after me, and from the smoke and debris, Steelhose had grenade machine gunned the upper walls of the lobby until the static stopped. I groaned and sat up slowly, wiping blood from my eyes. That's Steelhose for you. We have a new problem. Velvet Remedy informed me, her voice seeming strange and far away. I blinked at her, trying to clear my vision, then looked towards the entrance where she was pointing. A shield spell had descended over the front door. Apparently, shooting up the lobby in Celestia's private school of magic triggered defenses. We made it up to the third floor before finding out that the stairwell to the next level had caved in forcing us to cut through the classrooms to reach the stairwell on the opposite side. I'm not surprised. My plan to avoid detours was off to a bad start. I pushed open a door, checking my EFS for hostels, then made my way into the classroom. The building was old, but mercifully free of pink cloud, allowing us to proceed cautiously. We were operating under the assumption that the administrator's office was on the top floor, and would have a terminal capable of shutting off the shields locking us inside. At least, that is what we assumed the large space at the top of the tower was meant to be, based on a map which had decorated the lobby's back wall. A map which had lost large chunks under Steelhose Grenade Barrage. Even in its state of decay, the room was elevated by touches of glass that set it apart from the buildings outside of Canterlot. Filigree in the walls and furniture, the tattered remains of rotting banners, the cracked marble tiles of two-tone blue checkerboard floor. I paused, staring at the globe tucked in the corner. The continent's beginning to peel off of its surface. Strangely, I'd always considered Equestria to be flat. I looked around. The last lesson taught in this room was apparently astronomy, as the chalkboard still bore a diagram of, if I was reading it correctly, the single path on which the sun and moon circled our world. This was not something the science classes in Stable 2 had covered. We had learned instead about mechanics and robotics, arcane science and spellcraft. I had sometimes pondered where the sun went when Celestia put it away, imagining it was all hidden beneath us, possibly taking a nap. If this diagram was true, then Celestia was sending it to another part of the world to make it day, someplace else. I wondered if that was the faraway land where the zebras lived, or maybe the place where the dragons originally came from. Did that mean that Nightmare Moon had locked them in eternal day, slowly roasting them alive? And... How messed up did things have to be now in order for the Pegasi to occasionally see the sun and the moon and the sky at the same time? Unbelievable, Velvet Remedy intoned. I turned to see that I was not the only pony distracted by the contents of the room. 
Velvet had trotted up the steps that ran alongside the rising rows of chairs on the side of the room. That would make the sense. At the top, near another doorway, were several posters. Velvet was staring at one which featured a very small filly, magically projecting a shield around herself and her family as an evil-looking zebra lowered a stick of dynamite towards her with a fishing pole. They were actually teaching children to use their shield spells to protect themselves from a mega spell attack. Velvet Remedy stomped. From the poster, I gleaned that the spell was one of the very first taught to any unicorn who had the capacity to learn it. They might as well have been telling them to hide under their desks. Uh, Remedy, there ain't no desk in this room, Calamity pointed out. Velvet Remedy swung around and saw the rows of chairs in the lectern. There was not a single desk in sight. She sighed. Not the point. Maybe Celestia just didn't want them scared, I offered. I had to imagine that telling the children a lie that allowed them to believe there was something they could do was kinder than leaving them feeling helpless. Or was my belief just born of corrupted kindness? I grunted, absolutely hating Trixie. Red You're not the only one. Up on my EFS compass. You're not the only one, Pip. Several of them, converging on the door next to Velvet Remedy. Velvet! I hissed, motioning her towards me before pointing warningly at the door. Calamity, now wearing his battle saddle, flew into position, covering the door. I, I like how they made a play on the duck and cover thing. Like, instead of, you know, duck and cover, it's, uh, pull your shields up. Up, you know? Which, which does make sense, because the duck and cover thing was mainly a thing to help people, to, you know, believe they had a chance. Door. I whispered up a prayer to the goddess Celestia that ended up becoming more of an apology for shooting her in the face. The door opened, and I felt myself go numb. It was a small, canterlot ghoulized unicorn child. Her school filly uniform melted into her flesh. There were several more behind her, all colts and fillies, locked in the endless routine of going to and from their exams. Until they spotted us, and the air filled with a sound more horrifying than any I could imagine. A wordless sound of unadulterated and monstrous aggression from a chorus of achingly childlike voices. No. Celestia, have mercy. Oh. I was frozen. My eyes locked onto the monster children. I... I couldn't do this. Calamity fired, the twin bulls from his battle saddle tearing into a filly's head, blasting most of her brains onto the Remember Your Shield poster. Turning to the rest of us, he yelled, What are y'all waiting for? I knew they weren't really children. I knew they were, at best, feral animals, and that they would kill us if we didn't fight or run. But my body refused to do either. Calamity fired again. Next to me, Velvet cast her anesthetic spell on a young colt, only to moan as the spell had no apparent effect. Even Steelhoof seemed to have faltered for a moment. But now, I heard the ports of his missile launcher opening. Whoosh. Kaboom. Two rockets fired at an upward angle and exploded against the ceiling, bringing large chunks of it raining down on the creatures, children, below, along with half of a row of chairs from the classroom above us. I stumbled back as two colts and a filly were crushed under the collapsing ceiling, the little pony on my head sickly wondering if that had killed them or just inconvenienced them even after the lights went out on my EFS compass. Little Pip, Steelhoofs commanded, get us up there. Up there? I felt like I was thinking through sludge. Now, he bellowed, snapping me out of my stupor. Calamity swooped past me, firing again as another okay. canterlot zombie colt galloped through the open door and leapt over the rubble towards us. The twin shot hit the monster child in the side, knocking him back into the chairs. I wrapped my levitation field around the rest of us and levitated us up through the ceiling. Behind me, I heard the sinister warping sound that signaled one of the fallen cloud children was rising back up, filled with necromantic life. I poked my head out of the classroom, looking both ways down the corridor. I kept expecting the zombie children to appear, but there were no hostile lights on my EFS compass. I couldn't tell if they were trying to get up to this level, or if they had ceased pursuing us the moment they could no longer see or hear us, literally out of sight, out of mind. The hallway provided a new danger. The air was filled with a pink haze, which grew thicker towards a ventilation grate in the ceiling. I could just make out the large metal fan behind that grate, 
warped and fused with the metal of the shaft itself. The dense patch didn't look particularly large, but it was slowly growing. Steel hooves, I instructed, closing the door. We need you to scout ahead. Find the shortest path into another cloud of the section of the building. The Steel Ranger outcast nodded. I opened the door long enough for him to gallop through, then closed it again. Hey, Pip, Calamity said, his voice almost a whisper. I'm pretty sure one of the first Ministry buildings is the Ministry of Magic. I'm thinking we should pop in there and grab ourselves some proper magical energy weapons, just in case we have to deal with a bunch more Candlelight ghouls. Uh, here we go, I sighed, groaning inside and forcing myself not to face off. Well, magical energy guns are a mite better against the Candlelight ghouls than what we're packing. Steals aside, that is. Calamity reasoned, altogether too reasonably. And we shouldn't be relying on him to bring down the house every time we face more monsters. And for that matter, Velvet Remedy chimed in, we really need to stop in the Ministry of Peace. It's right across the way, and we could definitely use the medical supplies. <coughs> Especially if you end up fighting with those alicorns. Of course we do. I turned to both of them. Look, the more sightseeing we do, the longer and more dangerous this trip becomes. We're already taking far longer than I wanted to just to get out of the first building. All the more reason to get extra medical supplies while we can. You know the Ministry of Peace will have supplies somewhere. I nodded. Somewhere. That's the problem. You're not talking about a brief stop, either of you. You're talking about exploring those buildings. Velvet Remedy nodded. I know that, and I know it's dangerous, but I'm worried. No, you just want to see Fluttershy's ministry. Velva took a step back, feigning a wounded heart. My expression was unmoving. Okay, fine. Yes, I do. But I am also worried. She insisted. About steel hooves. Steel hooves? Calamity echoed. Why are you worried about him? The guy can survive anything, up to and including the apocalypse. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes. He's immortal, not indestructible. That armor might repair itself, but how do we know he's okay inside? The only things that heal ghouls are radiation and healing potions, and that suit of his is designed to self-administer. Now the last time he restocked his armor's medicine dispensary was Stable 29. And since then, he's been shot through with anti-tank rounds, fallen a few hundred feet, and gone through whatever he was put through in Zebra Town. Look, Velvet, if Steel Hills was in trouble, he'd tell us, Calamity said. Would he? Velvet questioned. I found myself caught, unable to decide which of my friend's flaws were at play here. Velvet Remedy's excessive worries, or Steel Hills' stubborn stoicism. I suspected this was the other problem that Velvet had claimed Steel Hills was being. I couldn't blame her for being concerned. Best case, she was a doctor who was being denied the ability to examine a patient, and the Wasteland wasn't in the habit of serving up best cases very often. I was beginning to kick myself for having taken Steelhoof's durability for granted. Well, they were gummies. But that was before he got shot, Velvet Remedy reminded the Pegasus. Afterwards, he only came back long enough to pick us up. Damn. Calamity rubbed his brow under his hat. I reckon you might be onto something there. Turning to me, he suggested, Lil' Pip, maybe you ought to run a diagnostic on his armor and see just what state our friend is in. For all we know, he might be really torn up under all that steel. I looked at the door, wishing Steel Hills was back already. Okay, okay, okay. Ministry of Peace and Ministry of Magic. But only the fastest looks, and only until we find what we need. Targeted missions. No sightseeing. They both nodded. Then, Velvet Remedy added, Actually, I was really hoping we could take a peek in the goddess's castle, too. I face hoofed. Oh my no. god! I gasped, collapsing against the storage room shelving, the impact sending several boxes of cleaner toppling down on my head as I fought for breath. My heart struggled in my chest. Velvet Remedy slammed the door closed behind her, the last one in. She crashed into steel hooves, bouncing between him and the workbench Calamity had curled up on before falling to her knees. I can't believe... 
You've done that to yourselves before. She gasped wretchedly. Velvet began passing around healing potions. Under the police station was much worse. Calamity moaned, downing his potion. Why do you think I saw blowing up the boiler as a better alternative? Velvet groaned shakily. <sighs> Forgiven. She floated her own potion to her lips and drank greedily. I drank the potion Velvet had passed to me and closed my eyes, waiting for the healing effects to begin to mend my cloud-ravaged body. Velvet passed a second round of potions, and I could see that the stop in the Ministry of Peace would be truly necessary after all. Weakly, I slid myself across the floor to steel hooves. Lay down, soldier, I demanded, hurting too much to perform the social dance that friendship and civility required. Steel hooves obeyed without question, accidentally knocking over a row of plungers with his armored tail. I pulled a tool from my barding and jacked my pit buck into his armor, running a diagnostic. Steel of displeasure at this invasion of privacy was radiating off of him, but he didn't move or speak. The little pony in my head began to panic when my pit buck started flashing medical alerts across my EFS. I fought to keep my little pony calm as I worked to strip away the alarms that were probably false. My pit buck's medical assist spell was not calibrated towards ghouls, much less whatever physiology was normal for canter like ghouls. I wished I had Velvet Remy's understanding of medicine. Although, considering her reaction to ghouls, that might not be much help. The one thing I could say for sure was that Steelhoof's armor was completely out of healing supplies, and apparently had been out since partway through Zebra Town. The stallion was keeping himself going on painkillers and combat drugs, most of which were also nearly depleted. What had he been planning to do when these ran out? Hell, one of his legs was broken in multiple places. The armor was just holding it together like a cast. Not okay, I told him sternly, feeling like I was wearing Velvet Ramity's horseshoes. He said nothing. If you're in trouble like this, you need to tell us. I'll be fine, he finally said. But I noticed he wouldn't look at me when he said it. The damn thing was, he probably would be so long as he didn't get himself permanently killed, or before he could resupply his armor. Between now and then, however, was a whole world of pain. The painkillers were handling a lot of it right now, but not all of it, and they too would be gone soon. This felt like self-punishment, maybe for what happened on Buckland Bridge, or maybe because of bad memories, wounds and regrets that coming here into Zebratown have made fresh again. I could point out that when the painkillers stopped, the pain might hamper him, putting us all at risk. That was the sort of argument I knew he would listen to and accept but it was also cold and selfish. Steele's was our friend, and he deserved better than that. I needed something to say that would show that we cared, and yet would still be persuasive in his ears. I looked to Velvet Remedy for help, only to be reminded of our argument about the Fluttershy Orb. Velvet Remedy was escaping. Steele's was abusing himself. I looked up at Calamity, and wondered if he was doing any better. Calamity seemed fine, but then, so had Steelhoves, until I took a deeper look. At least Zenith was okay, right? No. Zenith never really seemed okay. After what she had been through, I would be surprised if there was an okay in her world that even vaguely resembled the one in our own. Her freak out of being bitten was still fresh in my mind, but at least she was getting better, I thought, rather than worse. Although at the time we had left, Zenith had still not admitted to Zephyr that she was her mother. Was that just Zenith being a zebra? Or was it a warning sign? Something else I had missed. Steelhoofs pushed himself back up, disconnecting his armor from my pit buck. I should go. Go where? Out, he replied, to find the next room that is clear of the cloud. Velvet Remedy tossed up her shield the shimmering screen of magic filling the hallway just in time for the three baby dragons to slam into it. The little wingless creatures growled and clawed at the shield, their eyes glowing, their faces distorted by rage. Oh, aren't they cute? Velvet cooed. She got a resounding no from the rest of us. More trouble at our four, Calamity warned. I spun around. From the other end of the hall, several colts and fillies emerged from the stairwell. The lead filly had another cloud-ruined baby dragon on her back. 
I stared at the filly, my eyes drawn to... Little Pip, what are you staring at? In black horror, I hissed. Look at her cutie mark. The school filly's tattered uniform gave a clear view of the blob of dark pink that emblazoned the cloud child's flank. I reeled at the implications. The child had gotten her cutie mark after the mega spell, after she had died. That the cloud had transformed the poor little filly into an undying monster was horrific enough, but somehow the idea that it had warped and corrupted her to the point that the pink cloud had stolen from her what should have made her special, and replaced that with itself, was somehow so much crueler, so much more abhorrent. The child horror lowered her head, her horn glowing a violet pink. Thick wisps of pink cloud snaked out of the air around her glowing horn, swirling as it filled the corridor. The filly was actually conjuring pink cloud. The baby dragon jumped off of her back and began charging at us, its little claws tearing at the hallway carpeting. The twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle echoed through the hallway, the baby dragon's body ragdolled against the wall. A moment later, the tendrils of pink began to reach us. Immediately, my head swam, my headache spiking. I backpedaled, trying to get away, only to hit Velvet Remedy's shield. The three baby dragons behind us gave little roars of anticipation and violent desire. What? Calamity coughed. Is with the rest of you all. The Pegasus dropped to the ground, unable to keep flying as the pink cloud began to eat at its insides. He fired blindly into the pink. They're not really children. I could hear the cloud children galloping down the hall towards us. All I could see was pink and black, the edges of my vision beginning to go dark. Oh no. My EFS compass was showing nothing but a mass of blurry red. Every breath seemed to shrivel my lungs, making me fight harder to get half the air I could breathe the breath before. Velvet Remedy collapsed beside me, her shield going down. One of the baby monsters leapt at me, claws scratching my barding and digging wet scratches in my flesh, its teeth sinking into my mane, trying to tear at the back of my neck. Seal hooves opened fire in the hallway. I curled up as best as I could, and was pelted with concussive waves and shrapnel from the close quarters explosions. The blasts left my ears ringing, my sense of direction and balance shot to hell. But they also thinned the cloud. My gut was twisting, my insides felt like they had begun to rot, but my headache cleared just enough that I could focus. I floated out little Macintosh, aiming it at the small monster gnawing on my back, and fired. I felt the creature drop from my back, the poor thing which should have been allowed to grow up, to be a dragon. Velvet Remedy was curled into a ball, crying. The two other baby monsters were trying to eat her. Her body was a tapestry of shallow, bleeding scratches. I fired twice more, getting them off of her, and stumbled to my hooves. Somehow, dreadfully, it was easier for me to shoot these creatures than the monsters who took the form of children. As if the fact they had never grown old enough to talk or think like people made it more okay to treat them as rabid animals. My eyes forward spark was flashing medical warnings. Even thin, the pink cloud was killing me. I needed to get out before my internal organs started to shut down. Wrapping velvet in my magic, I galloped as fast as my legs and lungs would let me. A staggering trot, trying to get out of the pink. Behind me, Calamity fired once more, then pivoted and followed, stumbling as he attempted to run. The air filled with that noisome grating sound as the eyes of the baby dragon Calamity had shot began to glow, and it began to growl. Get to the top. Our Applejack's ranger called back to us. I'll hold them here. None shall pass. We're down to the last of our healing potions. Velvet Remini warned softly, tears in her eyes. I groaned as I drank the potion she floated over to me. We hadn't even made it to Ministry Walk yet. And I still haven't had a chance to restock Stilo's armor. I watched as the slashes of red that covered Velvet closed gently mending themselves before my eyes, looking her completely unmarred, yet still covered in her own blood. The mare swayed despondently, then curled up next to Calamity on the large bed in the center of the room. The large circular room had no windows, but both the fireplace and the chute provided means for the pink cloud to enter the room. Fortunately for us, a magical ventilation spell had prevented the pink cloud from pulling in here, leaving the air only the slightest shade of pink. Survivable levels of pink so long as none of us fell asleep in here. 
The administrator's room had been a lovely room once. A solemn room of violets and blues with a mural of clouds drifting along the wall, and a delicate ornateness to every feature and piece of furniture. Ghosts of that beauty remained in the greasy rod of the carpet, bed, and tapestries. A golden scroll-shaped stand leaned against one wall next to a crumbling bookshelf filled with decayed books and the residue of several dissolved scrolls. Next to the center of the bed was another golden stand, this one holding a terminal, its screen glowing softly still. The door into this room had been one of the hardest locks I'd ever encountered. I expected no less difficulty from the terminal. It just isn't right, Velvet Remedy choked, leaning against Calamity. All those children, those little baby dragons. Calamity wrapped a wing around her as she began to sob again. They didn't deserve this. None of them deserved this. It's just so unfair. It was worse than unfair. This was evil. I felt a bubbling rage simmering into my beating heart. But there was no pony to be angry at. I couldn't be mad at the victims and the zebras, possibly ponies too, who created and deployed the mega spell. All of them were long dead. No, I was furious with the pink cloud itself. How dare it? I began to hack, trying to focus, not wanting to take my frustrations out on the terminal lest I make a mistake and get locked out. Little Pip, Velvet said softly. If... if the mega spell is still working here, still pouring out this poison... Her eyes closed, her trembling voice finding determined steel. We need to stop it. I nodded. The password was apologies. My host was checking his watch. The little hoof pointed to seven, the big one just a few minutes past the hour. It was either late morning or less than an hour from midnight. I had no way of knowing. The hallway is a cold, gray metal with no windows, yet it felt like night. A soft chime from behind drew my host's attention. He turned as the elevator doors opened, party music playing over the speaker in the room. The elevator seemed empty. My host stepped away, watching cautiously. The elevator doors closed again, cutting off the sound of music. I could barely hear the soft hum as the elevator began to descend. My host looked to the left. Empty hallways, no doors, ending with the heavy steel door of a vault. He looked to his right. A magical field of blue light shimmered in front of the iron gate. The room beyond was filled with humming mainframes. I apologize for running late, an exotic voice said from the nothingness, sounding slightly muffled. First, the head of the zebra appeared as she pulled back her hood, then the rest of her. I did not mean to make you wait. I felt my host press his lips together. That's all right, Zakora, but you'll have to hurry. Security will cycle any minute now. When it does, we've arranged for the shield to drop, but it will only be down for a few minutes. You'll have to get in, get the data, and get out. I saw my head turn away as I fished a key out of the pocket of my security uniform. This will get you through the gate. You know which system you're looking for, right? Zakora nodded. A sad look formed on her face. I ask if this is worth the cost. The lives of ponies will be lost. I felt a frown edge across my host's muzzle. We have to be willing to make sacrifices if we're going to end this war. Your success here will get you the Kaisar's trust, and that will allow you to get close to him. My host stepped back. But if it helps, I'm sure they'll arrange for the weapons factories and those schematics to have minimal staff when the zebras hit them. My host's frown turned into a grimace. Unfortunately, we've had a small complication. Zakora raised an eyebrow. They've installed some sort of new gemstone detector, something from the Ministry of Image, of all places. It's designed to detect zebra talismans like your cloak, and it's not part of the normal security system, so we can't shut it down without raising alarms. You'll have to remove your cloak before going in. I will not need it once I'm in there, so I will leave it in your care. Zakora slipped out of her cloak, now wearing only a satchel. She looked strangely naked without the jewelry I'd seen her wearing before. The shield of blue energy suddenly went down. My host sucked in a breath. Quickly, strike me down. Hard. 
Zakora spun and bucked at my host. One hoof caught him squarely in the chest, cracking at least one rib. The other sank hard into the soft flesh of his neck. Zakora's eyes widened as I collapsed, choking, fighting for air. She had clearly not intended to land a possibly fatal blow. My host waved her on, coughing and fighting to remain conscious. Zakora galloped down the hall. I heard her unlock the gate and pull it open, but my vision was blurring. I sat there, fighting harder and harder, trying to breathe, air struggling to get through my throat and into my chest. I heard the chime behind me. The door opened and an apple green stallion in tuxedo barding stepped out, looking around. Apple snack. Steel the moment he saw me, his eyes widened, then narrowed, taking in the discarded zebra cloak nearby. Damn it! I knew something felt wrong. He looked up, observing the open gate and disabled magical shield. Hold on, Buck. I'll get. Apple snack froze, his voice silencing abruptly as the core rounded the mainframes, heading back. You. Applesnack stepped into a battle stance as Zakora stopped short. You. Applesnack called out, fury in his voice. Applesnack, Zakora said, failing to rhyme, her eyes growing wider. She trusted you. She let you into our house, and you betrayed her? Applesnack was striding slowly forward. I opened my heart to you because she wanted me to. I even began to trust you to like you. A zebra. How could I have been so stupid? Ah. Ah. My host wheezed, holding up a hoof and trying to stop Applesnack. Don't... Don't... But there was almost no sound to my voice. I, we, struggled to get up, but our hooves wouldn't work. I realized we really were dying. She thought you were a friend. You broke her heart. Applesnack was roaring. I suddenly knew. This was what was hurting him. I remembered Steelhoof's denial when I told him the truth about Zakora, and the painful resignation that seemed to follow. I would prefer she had killed these monsters with cold-blooded calculation. Steelhoof had told Calamity regarding my rampage in Arbu. It wasn't the killing he had thought was bad. It was the blind rage. And now you come back, tonight of all nights, to hurt her again? Zakora crouched down submissively. You have caught me. I do not fight, she intoned. I am your prisoner tonight. Applesnack stooped, shaking. Then screamed, bellowing. No, Zakora, this is not how you say died, resisting arrest. No. No, Steelhoofs. Don't do this. He charged, turning and bucking at Zakora. She didn't try to dodge, at least not the first time. She did the second, and the third, and the fourth. My host flailed as darkness began to seep into the edges of his vision. The fight for breath was getting harder, and he was losing. His whole body felt weak and distant. I didn't feel the hum of the elevator at all, but we heard the chime. As the door slid open, an oddly familiar song floated into the hallway. It was the same song that had played in Steelhoof's shack the morning I had first really met him. The song he had become strangely lost to. My host struggled again, trying to get up, trying to make any part of his body work now. We weren't getting air anymore. Down the hall, I saw Zakora strike out trying to defend herself. Applesnack ducked under the kick and brought up one of his own, striking her underneath and sending her body flying against the wall. Zakora hit the wall with a meaty smack, leaving a splash of blood as she fell below. From within the elevator came a horribly familiar voice. Oh, nuts and shrews. I knew the boy was planning on proposing at night, but if we're missing our song because Sergeant Steelhoofs has become Sergeant Coldhooves. Oh no. No, 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 no. Don't come out here, Applejack. Don't see this. It'll hurt you if you see this. We've been trying to repair our relationship, Steelhose had told me. Ever since the night she had seen the darkness in me. Not learned about. 
seam. Applejack, wearing a little black dress that was clearly a rarity original, stepped out of the elevator. No. She looked to her right, seeing an empty hall ending in a vault door. No. She looked left. No. Her eyes widened, pupils dilated to Don't pinpoints as she me. saw Applesnack, bloodied, his torso heaving with each breath, standing over the very bloody corpse of Zakora. Why? Why? Why'd you have to end it like that? And now I have to go to the next chapter in the next video. <laughs> Which this one is Fluttershy. <laughs> Next one's Fluttershy. Uh, Twilight Sparkle. Uh, there's several. There's Pinkie Pie, the Rainbow Dash, and I'm assuming six is Rarity. But... Why? Why'd you have to... Never mind. I'm rambling. And this is Kit Kat's story, not mine. Well, anyway, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, this chapter. I followed Equestria. And I hope to see you guys in the next. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye.